Hi everyone, it's Joe here from Lawn Solutions Australia and welcome to this episode of Turf Talk where we're live from the Lawn Solutions Global Turf Conference on the sunny Gold Coast and I'm lucky enough to be joined by Simon Hutton, the Managing Director of Tillers Turf all the way from the UK. Simon, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Now, Tillers Turf, the UK, obviously you're a long way from home. How long have you been in Australia for and how's the trip been so far? It's been fabulous, thank you and thank you for the invitation. We uh, arrived on Friday morning Mm -hmm. and um, the LSA have totally blown their brains out with the (laughs) hospitality, so thank you very much. We've driven from Melbourne to Sydney looking at growers and then flew from Sydney to Brisbane and met some more growers and some great people. And then we're here today uh, pre-conference. Pre-conference. There's no rest for the wicked on an LSA tour, is there? You caught caught (laughs) up yet or are you all right? Well, as a contractor and turf grower, there's never any rest. Yeah, so so you're all right. You're all (laughs) right. No problem. So so the managing director at Tillers Turf. Now, Tillers Turf is quite a unique company. So what do you specialise in? Where do you operate in? What fields do you operate in? Uh, What do you do, basically? Tillers is a turf production site in Lincolnshire on the Nottinghamshire border. We grow 26 turf products there, mainly aimed at sport. Mm -hmm. We grow a few landscape products, but anything for golf. So tees, greens, fairways, bunker revetting turf, wispy fescue for links, parkland, heathland courses. Right. Everything. Everything. 26 different turf products. That's 26 different Varieties of turf. Varieties, heights of cut, and um, new ideas that we're coming up with. Right. And all cool season? All cool season. So you seed everything? We seed absolutely everything. Okay. Okay. And and this is where it gets exciting. So you you got a couple of pretty specialist contracts. So what are some of the high profile venues that you currently, that your turf is currently on? We set up... um, a hybrid turf system in the UK about five years ago. Right. The story as it goes, uh, the new Tottenham Stadium was built Mm -hmm. and they were looking for a hybrid turf to go in the stadium to do one year. Mm -hmm. We'd always stayed away from the hybrid system because it couldn't be renovated thoroughly enough and we couldn't we couldn't believe in it. We couldn't guarantee it to the standard that we we like to do. So we stayed away from it until we got approached by Tottenham. Right. So we put um, a carpet down on the field. Uh, we stitched it together. We filled the carpet and seed, seeded it. Okay. Um, with 13 weeks production time to harvest to be then transported and laid in the stadium. Right. So it was quite um, a baptism of fire so to speak. It's not the not the project you want to – actually, I'll be happy. <clears throat> I'm an Arsenal fan. I'll be happy if you stuffed it up. But it's not a project you, <laughs> you want to stuff up as your first time getting into something like that, is it? No, we had to get it right. Yeah. And we did, and it was a challenge yeah. from start to finish. Totally new concept. Um, we're very uh, good at adapting mm-hmm. at Tillers, but the harvesting was probably the biggest challenge. Yeah, I can imagine. Harvesting through a carpet, carpet – um, ensuring the rolls were to a standard, uh, making sure the backing was clean without any indigenous soil on it. Um, it was a challenge, some 20 plus hour days, but it, we made it happen. So but when, we learned an awful lot. I bet. So when you say hybrids, are they hybrids as we know them when there's a synthetic layer at the bottom and, turf, and natural turf in the synthetic layer, synthetic turf layer? Yeah. Similar. It's not quite as I understand it that you would understand it. Yeah. It's... Um, It's basically a 55 millimeter pile carpet. Okay. Which um, has got a a backing and then it's 3% artificial fiber, which is stitched to the backing. Right. So the challenge is stitching it together. It comes in a four meter roll. Mm -hmm. We lay it out on the field on a sand carpet, stitch it together. And then once it's stitched, we then brush the carpet to stand the pile up. Yeah. Then we start sand spreading in two millimeter layers and brush the sand in. Right. Gotcha. So, so we want to achieve approximately 40 millimeters of sand within the carpet. Yeah. Which the most important thing is we don't lose the fiber. If the fiber gets buried, you lose the stability and actually produce a skating ring. Okay. Right. So, so the infill is the most important part. Yeah. yeah. So that once the carpet is filled, the fiber is showing through the top of the sand. And who was showing you how to do this the first time you did it? Um, 
Nobody really, but we knew <laughs> yeah, good. we knew that um, from a few trials that we'd done, mm. if we didn't do it to a specific uh, specification or mm. to achieve what we knew we had to achieve, we knew that there would be some problems with play yeah. and stability and yeah. potential slippages on the pitch. And that's ryegrass. 100%, yes. Yeah. So then we rye. seeded it with 100% ryegrass at 55 grams a square meter, which is um, 550 kilos a hectare. Right, okay. And so so your turf's on Tottenham. Where else are we, are we watching the TV and seeing Tiller's turf at the moment? So that system evolved. Yeah. And we, we turfed Tottenham a couple of times. Mm. Um and it was successful. We then thought, well, we'll put a stock pitch in. And we had a really wet winter in 2020. And we ended up uh, re-turfing Swansea and Leeds that winter, right. which was good really because the Leeds pitch was actually um, a backup pitch for Tottenham. We, in those days, we were doing a, a spare pitch just in case anything went wrong because we didn't know. Okay. We didn't know whether it would succeed a year and they couldn't afford not to have a backup That's pitch. Ellen Road at Leeds. Yeah. yeah. So that the, the spare Tottenham pitch, um, we did a deal with Leeds and that went into there. Right. So um, that then evolved again another Tottenham pitch and we had a spare pitch in stock. But then the third year of Tottenham, they won pitch of the year with that pitch. Well, yeah. And total dedication of the grounds team to achieve that. Mm -hmm. For a turf tip pitch to win pitch of the year is something fairly special. Yeah. Where you've got all the hybrid pitches, the Deso, the Sis um, pitches. But for a turf pitch, which really turfing went out of fashion in the mid 90s. Right. Uh, sorry, early 2000s, sorry. Mm. Um, for a turf pitch to win pitch of the year, they'd done really well. Yeah. So that was really good publicity for mm. us. As, and then following that, Liverpool um, showed an interest mm -hmm. and actually removed their DESO system for our HT Pro system. Right. Um, following that, then the same year, Wembley tried a pitch. So all the small ones, yeah. Yeah, all the small ones. <laughs> no pressure, yeah. yeah. Wembley uh, sort of historically would do mini renovations through the year and did really well to get grass to grow really where, when it shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, they had an NFL event American football, and they gave us a try to grow them a pitch for three games for an NFL, right. which was a total success. Yeah. And subsequently to that, they've, we've got three in the ground for them at the moment. Right, okay. Yeah. 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 And cricket wickets and cricket outfields, that's something you guys dabble in too? Very it? much so, yeah. 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 And where are we talking there? The big ones? Yeah, the big ones. Yeah. So <laughs> um, just going back a step, we had an opportunity in – I think it was 1997. I was probably 18 or 19 yeah. to Holocore and collect the outfield at Lords. Okay, which yeah. was fairly something, as you can imagine. Yes. So we uh, follow it. We did a good job. Mm -hmm. The boys, you know, we were all young, and they gave us a chance, and and we pulled it off. But since then, really, we've worked for them continually, mm -hmm. and um, my cricket construction team have probably built every test wicket in the UK wow. in the last 20 years. Wow. Yeah, it's led by our uh, contracts manager, Jim Coleman, who is just attention to detail. Yeah. 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 Second to none. And and to to produce turf for all these high-quality venues and high-profile venues, what kind of farm are you running sort of production size-wise? Like are we talking hundreds and hundreds of acres, thousands of acres? What kind of business we got there? So – I actually acquired Tillers in uh, 2011. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was 300 acres, a very successful small turf business that sold multiple golf products and they were doing a great job. Yep. And it, at that point, it was 300 acres. My golf background with some, with a good golf team around me plus the contracting business that we had, we knew that what was being produced there could be improved on. Mm -hmm. And what we really wanted to do was give greenkeepers and groundsmen exactly what they wanted yep. and at heights of cut that they wanted so that basically the passage to play was so much quicker than an ordinary tour. Sure. So we extended that from probably six or seven products from tillers and over the last 10 to 13 years, we've taken it up to 26. Right. 
twenty six different turf products. How many how many acres are you farming? Two thousand two hundred okay. at the moment. Right, right. Enough to keep so you busy. Roughly ten million square meters. Wow, yeah. plenty to wow. go. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. And and obviously you've you've gone on quite the journey to get to where you are now and supplying turf to all these wonderful pitches. So where did the love of turf for you first start? Has it been something you've had for the bulk of your life now, or is it something you only came into sort of in the last ten years or so? I think. Um, it's fair to say I was born to do what I, I do yeah. and I don't think many people can say that and all my mates at school were like I don't know what I'm going to do well I knew exactly what I was going to do but I don't think I actually realised <laughs> that it would end up quite where we are now Yeah. yeah. Um, my father is a golf professional and uh, he's been a PGA professional now for 53 years oh, yeah. so the golf course he worked at as head professional I um, I was absolutely mad on the green keepers, the tractors, the 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 turf, everything they did. I was totally idolised towards it from the, really the minute I could walk. Um, and I'd follow them round and on my bike, and I'd get in their way. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that that evolved really because my father's dream was always to build and run his own golf course. Okay. Yeah. And in 1986, 87, he found a small pocket of land not far away from we, where we lived in Lincolnshire. And it was, it was a sheep field, 17 acres. And he had the foresight before the boom of golf to mow six greens out in the sheep paddock. Right. <laughs> put six pins in. We filled some Coke cans with cement and six inch nails and put them out. We, we cut the greens with a hand mower and gang mowed everything else. Yeah. We put an honesty box on the gate yeah. and it was a pound for the day to play golf <laughs> and it exploded. Really? And within six months, it, it he was able to leave the job that he did as head pro six miles up the road to go there full time. Yeah. And then it grew and grew from there. Yeah. In 1990, um, we built bought an, an additional 20 acres and we decided to turn that six holes into a good nine holes. Mm -hmm. So we built nine new greens, nine new tees, a few lakes, some ditches, some bunkers, some mounding. I was 11 at the time, <laughs> before the days <laughs> of health work. and day safety. Yeah. And I was on the machines doing it with dad. I mean, mum had a fit, <laughs> but she got over it. Um, so who built this? You and your dad? Dad and I built it. Wow, yeah. okay. Okay, yeah. and all the equipment and that sort of stuff, is that just something you slowly we, acquired? We, in those days, we had nothing. Yeah. Um, bank interest rates were 13%. Dad has only just recently paid the bank back. Yeah. It's a total labour of love for dad and mum. Yeah. Um, he, um, we hired, begged, borrowed. Some members from the golf club were farmers or earthwork people, so they helped us with equipment yeah. and without that we probably wouldn't have achieved what we did. Yeah. But summer 1990 we built it. Um and it was all seeded and it was I think it was about 14 months of growing mm. and then we opened it. So we were still running the old six hole the sheep paddock course. The sheep paddock yeah. course, but there were new greens within that. Yeah. But um yeah, then we opened the nine holes. Is it still there today? Still there today. Really? Yeah. We yeah. have a thousand members. Is it still your, fa your family run? Yeah. Okay. So my brother is teaching professional. Yeah. Dad doesn't teach anymore, but he is heavily involved day to day. He loves it. Yeah. Yeah. What's the golf course club called? It's course? called Sudbrook Moor and we're in Mid Lincolnshire. Okay, well, yeah. well there, there's a bit of a plug for yeah. our uh, small cohort of uh, UK listeners. But um, you didn't even put your last name in the name of the course. What's going on there? Yeah, <laughs> humble British. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So, okay, so you build a golf course with your bare hands at 11, and then what, what was the next step there? Um, as I was leaving school, although I probably didn't do too much at school, um, I um, had a lot of opportunities, and um, we lived in a very good village, and I probably started mowing lawns when I was about 12 or 13 years old, sold firewood, and when I was 15, I actually um, grew my first field of turf. Okay. And it was basically one acre, 4,000 square meters. It was an old sheep field. Yeah. And um, a, a, an old meta turf man came and took the sheep field turf away very cheap. 
and we ploughed and cultivated it and a local um, turf grower sowed it for me yeah. and about a year late no irrigation a year later um, we I started harvesting it with a Ryan turf cutter yeah. on a Saturday morning yeah and my mates were doing a paper round six mornings a week for about four quid. Mm. And uh, I was doing 50 square meters on a Saturday for 50 quid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was uh, it was good. But that really helped me start Fine Turf, which is the contracting company. Mm. Um, as soon as I left school, there was um, a local RAF base up the road. And the, the greenkeeper, the, the uh, volunteer greenkeeper there was a member at the golf club. And he asked me, uh, would I go and spray their greens? They'd had a quote for 400 quid. So I said, well, I'll do it for 300 and managed to get my mate to get the tractor and sprayer there. And at, at 16 years old, it was 300 quid in for a morning's work. And yeah. I thought, hold on a minute, yeah. I'm earning 50 quid a day, a week with dad. Yeah. I need to probably start thinking about some contracting work <laughs> yeah, here. Sure, yeah. And that's really where it began. Yeah. About six months later, our local Sisis equipment rep, had given Grimsby Football Club my um, telephone number and they said, Simon, here you've got a very light tractor with a sand dresser on the back. Would you come and sand spread the pitch? We want to get 60, um, 20 tonnes on the pitch. It's wet through. We can't get on it with anything we've got or anything big. So um, I gave them a price and literally they snapped my hand off, went and did it. And uh, again, that was another wake-up call to yeah. me is to think, hold on, there's a market out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Turned 17, passed my driving test, and with my mowing money and my log money and the turf money, I bought um, a truck, a trailer, a Wiedemann terrace bike, um, used the tractor off the golf course, and I sent a flyer to every golf course and sports club in Lincolnshire and got about 10% response. This was in mail in those days. Yeah. 10% 10 10 res uh, response within two weeks. Can you? have a look at this can you do that just hit the market totally right as dad had done with golf yeah some years earlier and it just grew and grew from there we went from one employee to five to seven to ten um yeah and it just grew and it went and went so there's obviously a pretty strong entrepreneurial spirit from a young age <laughs> um you know, do, doing what you did. And what, so what year are we talking now when you got the, the, the company that you started to sort of 10, 15, 20 employees? Where are we at now in the in So the 1995, timeline? I left school. Yeah. So 96 is when it really started. Yeah. I think we were at Lords in 97 or 8. Yeah. Um, and then it just, it was very slow growth, which looking back was exactly what it needed to yeah, be. Sure. Yeah. I was looking around me thinking these new companies are coming in, starting up, and they're winning all these big jobs. Mm -hmm. Why am I not doing that? Mm -hmm. And the slow growth was the best growth because looking back, those companies aren't here anymore. Yeah, sure. And yeah. some had some bad debt. Some yeah. just didn't stand the pace of time. Yeah. Um, so it was very slow growth. Uh, the Lords thing really helped us when we started doing that. Yeah. That yeah. name opened a few doors. Yeah. And got the head groundsman in those days, um, a chap called Mick Hunt, he was recommending us, you know, these young lads, they do a good job. Yeah. So we had we had to do the job right to get the the referral, but we got the referrals. So And and then what was the transition then to make you want to buy a turf? production company or invest in a turf production company what, what triggered that for you so i got the four thousand square meter one one acre block yeah and that then when i i don't know 16 or 17 i turned that into 10 acres right and then 10 acres went to 20 and by the time we my philosophy was we were doing a great construction job but we weren't able to supply the good quality turf for a bowling green. So we'd do a great construction job and then the turf would let the job down. So yep. we expanded from one turf product to two or three. Mm -hmm. So by the time I bought Tillers in 2011, we were growing 200 acres under the name of Fine Turf. Right. So <clears throat> Tillers, we then expanded Tillers from 300 acres over the last 12, 13 mm -hmm. years to 2,200, mm -hmm. but we still grew the 200 acres at Fine Turf. It was in... Good job we did because in the turf boom, we tillers were harvesting at fine turf, and it's only in the last three years that we haven't 
grown turf, fine turf, we've moved that acreage totally over to tillers now. Right. So we haven't reduced any acres, but it's all within a sort of eight or nine mile block. Yeah. As opposed to a 25 mile block that was. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and and you work today. So what's it like working in, in the quality of the venues that you work in? Is it a high pressure environment constantly while you're on site? Um, or do you sort of get given, yeah, here's a window, take your time, get it right and get it done? Or is it, hey, let's go, 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 we need this? Um, good question. I don't think there's ever a dull day. Yeah. I don't think the pressure is ever off because if we're not battling the weather or um, time deadlines, mm -hmm. we're up against it all the time. Yeah. Um, we always manage to pull it off. Um, but good planning, a good team, um, it, it, it's been successful. Yeah. But we do get some very tight deadlines, night shifts, day shifts, whatever we need to do to pull it in. Yeah. An example would be Tottenham last year, they had Lady Gaga for three nights in the stadium. She finished at midnight on the Saturday. They took the staging out and all the uh, track way out on the Sunday. We got it 7 a.m. Monday morning. Right. We handed it back to them at 11 a.m. on Friday morning. Right. The players were on it at midday training. They played Southampton first game of the Premiership, three o'clock on the Saturday. So, so that was probably one of the tightest deadlines. I mean, it went like clockwork, but a breakdown, which we all get. Yeah. But we'd sort of had to gear up with double harvesters, double team, had to have two of everything because we just couldn't afford to be 200 miles from home. Yeah. And something goes down and we're half a day trying to sort it out. So we had to react to that deadline. We actually start Tottenham again on Tuesday coming so okay. tomorrow. Yeah. We've got, I think we've got four days grace this time, right. which is a little bit better. There's an Australian manager in charge now, so you make sure you treat that place. <laughs> so take us through the process. So Lady Gaga or someone finishes, you get it on a, a Monday morning. So what process are you actually going through to get that right and to get that actually playable in seven days? So what? So you're stripping out what's there? The turf had already been taken out. Yeah. Because what we don't like to do is leave a, a rotting turf under the trackway. Right. So that had been taken out and the upper root zone, which is a 90-10 sand soil, was sort of all over the place level-wise because we'd only had so many hours to, to coro out. Yep. So we came in with some new root zone, topped the levels back up and laser graded it um, and consolidated it, got some water on it because it was quite loose. Mm -hmm. There's no stabilisation because the turf brings the stabilisation. Yep. Um, and then we just start laying. A gang of 15 and 16 men, the lorries are coming in. So we night harvest at Tillers. So we'll start at 10 a.m., sorry, 10 p.m. the night before, mm. and we'll work through the night, and there'll be a lorry load every hour and a quarter to land at Tottenham. Right. Then there's a team at Tottenham that then unload the truck, get it into the stadium, and start laying. Maxi rolls? Big rolls, yeah. Yeah, and they and they're, they come with, like, how thick are they? Like, how much soil are you bringing with you? They're they're 40 millimetres deep, yeah. thick, yeah. but that's a USGA sand within the carpet. The right. backing of the carpet is totally clean, no indigenous soil. Yeah. So it's the roots should go straight into the upper root zone. If you bring in any contaminant from under the carpet, that will restrict the root growth. And the, car and the carpet, the matting, and that 40 mil of soil is enough for people to play on and for it to hold together to You'd spine. never move it. You'd never know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. And this is something that you do across all the fields that you contract to now, how often would your standard Premier League pitch be re-turfed now? Five years ago, we weren't turfing pitches. The standard of pitches was totally up there. The DESO, the SIS systems, you've got the stability, and that's what you see in the, most of the English Premiership mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. However, our system, off the back of what was happening at Tottenham, after COVID, the clubs were thinking, Hold on a minute. We coro the pitch. It takes eight weeks to um, renovate, grow in, and to the first game, we're losing eight weeks worth of revenue mm. for the stadium. Mm. So our system basically allows them to have seven weeks more revenue. We go in in the last week, yeah. turf it. So from Tottenham, it went from 
uh, to Liverpool. Wembley have three. We've just done the London Stadium, which is where West Ham play. Yeah. Um, and then Tottenham again, which is next week. And so time-wise, sorry. So time-wise, it's cheaper for the football club to re-turf than it is to renovate just because of the window that it takes for it to cover. Yes, and right. the revenue they would generate in that extra seven weeks. Mm-hmm. It's not cheaper for them, but it's better for their bottom line to do it that way. That's yes. Incredible. Right, right. So the, the reason um, you have to have such big acreage is to cater for that change of thinking from the stadiums, is it now, that they want this new turf so often? Most of the acreage would be um, for golf. Oh, for golf, right. Cricket and landscape. Right. We um, have eight pitch. We've had eight pitches in the ground. Yeah. So we have a stock pitch. We've got Tottenham's going in next week, but then the six before that. Um, so, so we would have eight hectares of of hybrids. So okay. It, right. In in percentage, it's very tiny. Yeah. Right. Right. And so so golf um, from a volume point of view, golf still your bread and butter now. Um, golf is where the passion is. The innovation, yeah. the, the tweaking. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's where our hearts are. I mean, hybrid turf growing is is, is great. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we can do it in 12 weeks, so it's a quick turnaround. Yeah. The standards are incredibly high. It keeps yeah. us on our toes. And it's another addition to what we do, which everybody at Tillers and Fine Turf get a buzz from. Yeah. So it's, it's good for that. And so your dad was a golf pro, still is a golf pro. How's your golf game? Mine, yeah, terrible. Is it? <laughs> Don't ask. I can get by. <laughs> you get by. Yeah. And he's still a golf pro now. Is he still on the tour? Or? No, he's not on the tour. He's yeah. still a fe- affiliated PGA professional. Yeah, but his passion is that golf course. Is that golf course? Yeah. What a story. Yeah. yeah. How cool is that? I'll have to check that out one day. And is this your first time here? Your first, first time in first Australia. First time Australia. Yeah. Now we're we're quite similar in a lot of ways, uh, especially the northern. I guess you'd call yourself a northerner, wouldn't you? Is that what you? The Southerners would call us not. So the yeah. Southerners would call yeah, it makes a bit of sense. But <laughs> we're quite similar. So what's sort of what what's different to what you thought it'd be since you come here and what's exactly how you thought it was going to be? I think the hospitality and the um the friendliness of, of everybody that we've met has been brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh it's certainly a lot friendlier strangers are than you'd get in the UK. Yeah. To, to come here and talk turf to turf growers and turf professionals and the men that work the kit, mm-hmm. I think that's just second to none experience. Yeah. Turf's turf. I've learned a lot about warm season grasses yeah. here and it, it's really interesting. And there's a few things without question that, w- that we'll be taking away and be talking okay. to you yeah. further about. But just talking turf and turf business yeah. to these people has been fantastic. And what's your favourite bit of Auss- Aussie lingo you've heard so far? <laughs> you've heard a couple? <laughs> what was it? Tossers on the roadside or something. <laughs> so we went past one of the one of the signs where it says, um, <laughs> it's about, you know, people who throw litter out and they say, you know, say no tossers or whatever it is. And Simon, um, I think tosser might, means quite something different in the English language. And our, our government put them on our road sign. So that was quite an eye opener when we were travelling down the highway today. But um where to next for you in Australia? You've been here for a couple of days. You've like you said, you've been from Melbourne. You've driven up to Sydney, and then you've hopped up to the Gold Coast. Now, where's the next couple of days take you? So we've got the conference tomorrow. Yeah, which kindly been asked to speak at, mm-hmm. which is an honour mm-hmm. to share my experiences. If you heard some of it today, mm-hmm. um, and then we're heading to um, Thailand mm-hmm. to see uh, Brad Burgess's farm. Okay, yeah. Um, Wentworth Golf Club in the UK, yeah. uh, I would say, is probably one of the most prestigious venues in the UK, and it hosts the BMW Championship. Mm-hmm. Their Chinese owner has just constructed a course just south of Bangkok okay. called Rainwood Park. Uh, Rainwood Park. Mm. So we're going to visit that, and I'm meeting uh, the director of golf from Wentworth there, Kenny Mackay. Oh, wow. Kenny's yeah. a good mate, so yeah. we're going to um, go and see Brad and, yeah. and check a few few things out there, as yeah. you can imagine. Yeah. And then... Yeah. Uh, Back to Dubai uh-huh. and then back to the UK. The world tour. World tour. The world tour. Well, it's been um, it's been so good to meet you. It's been so good to have you here. And if you're listening to this and next time you're watching a Premier League game or you're watching the Ashes or you're watching something, you'll now know where that turf comes from and the story behind it. And it's quite an incredible one. So um, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast and sharing and sharing such a great story with us all. Fabulous. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.